This program is brought to you by Emory University. My name is Randy Yu. I'm the project archivist for the Robert W. Woodruff papers here at the Manuscript Archives and Rare Book Library at Emory University. Excellent. So, um, Randy, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the exhibit that is going on in the uh, Robert W. Woodruff Library right now? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, the exhibit that we have up is called The Future Belongs to the Discontented, The Life and Legacy of Robert W. Woodruff. And um, one of the goals of this exhibit was to let people know who Mr. Woodruff was and um, what a powerful and lasting influence he's had on Atlanta and uh, on Emory University in particular. Um, mm -hmm. you know, this exhibit celebrates the completion of the processing of Mr. Woodruff's papers. Um, he gave us his papers and they have now been arranged and described so that uh, folks can come in and um, jump into the papers and discover a little more about uh, Mr. Woodruff, the making of modern Atlanta, the history of the Coca-Cola company, and a bunch of other topics. Uh, the depth and breadth of Mr. Woodruff's papers were actually very, um, was very surprising to me. Mm -hmm. Well, can you tell us a little bit about Mr. Woodruff? Who who was he? A lot of people don't really, they, they know his name. Sure. Uh, they've seen it at, uh, at Emory University and other places here in Atlanta, but they don't really know much about him. He seems like he was a, a much more private person than a lot of other donors are. He absolutely was. He was a very private person. Um, the simple answer is that Robert W. Woodruff was Atlanta's uh, most successful businessman and most generous philanthropist. Um, but that doesn't really cover everything. Um, he was a longtime head of the Coca-Cola company. He didn't invent the secret formula or come up with the script that you see on the sides of the bottles and the cans. Um, he didn't even come up with the name, but he is the person who's most responsible for turning Coca-Cola into the global product that we know now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can you tell us a little bit too about uh, Nell Hodgson Woodruff? Oh, sure. Uh, she is also featured. Uh, in the collection and is on display now. She is, and we have we have her papers. We have the Nell Hodgson Woodruff papers, which are a nice companion piece to Mr. Woodruff's papers. Mm -hmm. um, but she was Mr. Woodruff's wife, and um, two years before she got married to Mr. Woodruff, she completed a nursing program at uh, St. Mary's Hospital in Athens, Georgia. So she was always interested in nursing, and um, she continued that throughout her life, but her interest in nursing actually carried over to nursing education. That's why, due to her f interest in philanthropy, the, uh, the nursing school here at Emory is now the Nell Hodgson Woodruff uh, School of Nursing. So this was a lifelong interest of hers and a way that her interest in her giving continues to benefit Emory, the Atlanta area, the southeast, and probably the country also. Mm -hmm. Well. Um of course, the, the collection gives us insight into both of these, these two amazing Atlantans. Um, what, are, what, what are the objects in the collection? I mean, what, what kinds of, of materials are we talking about? We have an incredible range of materials. Um, it's almost 300, the Woodruff papers are almost 300 linear feet. Um, so it's an enormous collection. We have correspondence. We have subject files, we have family papers, we have photographs, we have scrapbooks. We actually have some of the Woodruff's home movies, which is actually a really interesting thing that almost no one has seen before until we put some of the stuff up in the exhibit. Um, so we have a whole range of materials that were gathered on Mr. Woodruff's behalf and that, he, and that were his, his personal papers. It's actually a very extraordinary collection, both in terms of the size, but also as I mentioned before, the range of the range and types of materials in that collection. Okay. And how did the uh, how did the university uh, come into this collection? How did these materials end up at the, the university library? Yeah. Um, this building, the Robert W. Woodruff Library, was actually the first building on the Emory campus that was named for Mr. Woodruff. Mm -hmm. um, he'd been giving to the university for over thirty years before he allowed them to name a building after him. And um, the room we're in, which is the Robert W. Woodruff room, we started acquiring materials at that time to put in this room to honor Mr. Woodruff. Um, and so it just became a natural kind of flow of events that it was expected that his papers would eventually come here. And uh, 
after he died, Joseph W. Jones, his uh, most trusted business associate, um, made sure that the papers came to Marble, and uh, so that's how they came here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and what kinds of objects are in the collection? I've noticed that there are uh, a variety of, uh, as you said, correspondence, but um, also uh, his, uh, Mr. Woodruff's old school yearbook, um, and there's some video and other uh, still images as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the, uh, the types of objects? And they do represent a, a number of different uh, parts of their lives. Yeah, it, know, it's a very young age. It's amazing. We have correspondence going back to um, his grandfather and his father when his father was a child. I don't know who kept all these materials, but the dates of the collection literally literally span from the 1860s up through the 1980s. So mm -hmm. it's an um, I don't. Know, I guess Mr. Woodruff kept some. Of this. We have some of his grade school assignments, um, like essays that he wrote. Mm -hmm. um, but we have thousands of photographs. Like I said, we have home movies that most people have never seen before. Um, and we even have some memorabilia, like we have some of Mr. Woodruff's canes and uh, things like that. So we really have a, uh, a full range of stuff that represents um, what um, Mr. Charles McTeer calls the Woodruff experience. Mm -hmm. It really is. Um, one of our more, I don't know if completes the right word, but it's one of our collections that has a, one of the broadest range of materials and artifacts and all that. We, we have paintings that Mr. Woodruff commissioned that he's very famous for his Christmas cards, which featured um, native birds and plants from Georgia, from his plantation down in Ichiway. And we have some of the paintings that Athos Minaboni did. So it's really an extraordinary, um, range of stuff mm -hmm. uh, that represents Mr. Woodruff's life. Okay. Um, and there's much more to this collection than what's on display at the exhibit at the moment. Yes. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, collection is almost 300 linear feet, mm -hmm. um, which is, I don't know if that's easy for y'all to uh, consider or not, but uh, linear foot's about like this. I imagine 300 of them. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a very, very very small portion of the collection that's actually on display and um, you know one of the reasons why we did this exhibit is um, Julie Delaquanti the director of the Shatton Gallery said Randy think of this as an advertisement for the papers like it took me three and a half years to go through all of Mr. Woodruff's papers most people don't have the time to be able to do that mm -hmm. so um, we want, you know, and a lot of people ask, well, you have Mr. Woodruff's papers, what exactly does that mean? And so what we wanted to do with the exhibit is give people an idea of both the types of materials in there, but the stories that are contained in the papers so that they can see um, why having the papers are important, because they tell stories about Mr. Woodruff, about Atlanta, about Coca-Cola, about Emory about wiping out malaria in South Georgia. Mm -hmm. And so that people can see these things become interested in them and then come up here to Marvel on the 10th floor and really dive into the Woodruff papers and look at some particular aspect of Mr. Woodruff and his life that interests them. So this is, this is um, you know, it's a cliche, but this is barely even the tip of the iceberg in terms of what the, what, um, the collection contains. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, so if someone comes to see the exhibit and they're interested in learning more, it's not that they're, you know, going to have to wonder what other items are in the collection. They can come up to Marvel and see that for themselves. Yes, we are open to the public, and you are welcome to come up and look at the Woodruff papers. In fact, I'd love it if you'd come up and look at the Woodruff papers. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what they're here for. Um, mm -hmm. Some archives think that they have uh, papers to. Um, to preserve forever, and so they block off access to them. We think we have Mr. Woodruff's papers to preserve forever, but we also provide access to them, which separates us from a lot of institutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure some people think archive and, and sort of assume that that means that it's squirreled away in some vault where it can't be touched or, or handled or seen. And, and uh, that is true, however, of some of the items in the collection. They had to be represented by a facsimile rather than the original. Right. Um, just um, 
preservation is very important to both the Shatton Gallery and to Marble. Mm -hmm. So some of the um, items that are in fragile condition, we actually made facsimiles of to display. But we did that so that the original item will still be around for future researchers to look at these important historical documents. Uh, so for display purposes, we did put some facsimiles in there, but that was for preservation reasons. Mm -hmm. So, but it is an accurate representation of the original rather than, you know, we just transcribed this for you. Oh, yeah, yeah. it is an accurate, yeah, it is. <laughs> it is as accurate as we could make it. Okay. Yeah. With so much material, you had to make some careful choices about what you put on exhibit. Yeah. Um, but I think you, you uh, did it in a rather ingenious fashion because you divided the exhibit into different sections. Yeah, it was a really hard decision about what to include. Mr. Woodruff was such an interesting person, um, with such a long reach in so many different areas that it was really hard to, because there's so many great stories and uh, so many impressive things that Mr. Woodruff did that it was really hard to narrow it down to just, um, we ended up with five kind of sections. Um, the first section is called Without, Rep Without Relying Upon His Father for His Position. And it has to do with Mr. Woodruff's life from the time he was born up until the beginning of 1923 when he took the job as president of the Coca-Cola Company. Mm -hmm. um, the second section is about Mr. Woodruff and his time at the Coca-Cola Company and how he influenced the Coca-Cola Company. You know, everyone said, well, if he didn't invent the secret formula, come up with the name or design the script, what did he do? for the company, so um, that section addresses that question. Um, the third, third section is about Mr. Woodruff and um, Itchway Plantation, his South Georgia plantation where um, he not only relaxed and enjoyed himself with his friends and his family, but um, he also undertook important efforts to um, eradicate malaria down there that ended up um, through various um, acts that ended up uh, with the CDC being located right up the street from where we are here at Emory University. And then the fourth section is about Mr. Woodruff and his influence on Atlanta and Emory University. And uh, the fifth section is about uh, his wife, Nell Hobson Woodruff. Okay. All right. um, so what will happen to the exhibit once it's been broken down from its, its current state? Uh, well, I assume it will come back up to, to marble. Once it's done, yeah, this, the materials will be integrated. I, I actually pulled these materials out of the Woodruff papers to make the exhibit, and once we're done with them, they will be reintegrated back into the Woodruff papers. Um, we're hoping to have um, a web presence for this exhibit once it comes down, and then we're also going to bring some of the materials to um, refresh the exhibits up here in the Woodruff room also. And he was really... a. Uh sort of a quintessential self-made man. I mean, he really wanted from his childhood to get out there and, and make a name for himself yeah. in business. Um, you know, I think with uh, his father being in such a powerful position, a lot of people might be content to take on the family business and, and you know, follow in their footsteps and, you know, start out from a position of wealth, but he really didn't. He, he went out there and got into manual labor and worked his way up from there. Yeah, that's a really extraordinary part of his story. Um, his father, Ernest Woodruff, was a banker, a financier, the head of Trust Company Bank of Georgia, which was the only trust company in the South at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and Mr. Woodruff could have very easily just followed the route and become a banker, but he wanted to prove himself. Um, after uh, he was politely dismissed from memory, he started shoveling sand for 60 cents a day and uh, worked his way up from there. And one of the remarkable things about him is um, his self-belief. I wouldn't say arrogance, but he believed that if he got a chance to, to make it into the working world, that he would be successful. He didn't know at what or in what area, but he knew he would be successful. And, Obviously, he was, he was very successful. Yes. Well, one of the things that, that uh, has been talked about um, about Mr. Woodruff now that people are learning more from this exhibit is, uh, and, and you wouldn't necessarily 
assume this given his uh, commitment to education, but he wasn't really a big fan of going to school. Um, but he obviously recognized the importance of education, um, you know, both to the individual and the community at large. Um, and I think that that's impressive. But uh, and why why do you think he was so committed to to the area um, and to really helping other people get a leg up? Would you say? Well, I mean, that's one of the really powerful things about Mr. Woodruff is his vision. Um, working for a global company like Coca-Cola Company gave him a broader perspective than just about any other businessman in the South at the time. And he knew that the fortunes of Atlanta and the Coca-Cola Company were intertwined. Um, and he knew for Atlanta to be the kind of place that he needed it to be and that everyone wanted it to be and that it could be, that the, we needed certain things that didn't exist at that time in the South. Right. You have to remember that you know the South, at the time he took over the head of the Coca-Cola company job, was a largely um, agricultural region that was three, four, maybe five or six steps behind the rest of the nation. Mm -hmm. And you know, some people called it the benighted South at the time. And the South just didn't have the kinds of institutions that large urban areas in the North had. And Mr. Woodruff recognized that we needed first-class medical facilities here in Atlanta. We needed a first-class medical school. We needed a first-class university that turned out people who would stay in the South instead of graduating from college and then leaving the region. And so that kind of underlied his commitment to Emory and then also to other facilities in, in the Atlanta area is um, he knew that, that the region needed it and the state at the time needed it. You know, we didn't have any of the robber barons uh, like the Vanderbilts and the Carnegies and all those people down here in the south. So Mr. Woodruff was um, very adamant that successful southern people should um, set up charities to help their region and their local areas mm -hmm. in the way that um, the robber barons had up north. Right, right. Well, he certainly had a lasting effect on, on Atlanta and the region. Um, you know, and it's, it's hard to think of anyone who had more of an effect <laughs> on a single place than Mr. Woodruff has. Mm -hmm. And, and yet he, he really didn't seem to um, you know, enjoy or you know, really soak up the attention as a result of, of being such a um, generous philanthropist. Um, I guess he was just, uh, he, had, he had his friends and he was open with them, but it seems like to the, the world at large, he was, you know, the you know, business person. Um, and that's, uh, it's kind of hard to do, or even hard to imagine in this day and age with the internet and you know, everybody being famous to some degree. Um, but that's, uh, that's amazing that, that so few really understand and, and know who he was. Well, and I think that's a testament to his feelings about um, Coca-Cola. Frederick Allen, the journalist and historian who wrote a book about the Coca-Cola company, said that Mr. Woodruff had almost a sacred belief in the product. So people from Forbes magazine, the Saturday Evening Post, would come to interview Mr. Woodruff and he would say, I'm not the story. The product, Coca-Cola, is the story. Um, so he's really remarkable. A lot of people have asked me, well, what would he think of this exhibit? And I have to tell him, he would have been embarrassed by it. <laughs> he would have been embarrassed by the attention and wouldn't have been comfortable at all with it, which is kind of ironic. <laughs> but that's, that's truly how he would, have, he would have felt. He would have been uh, uncomfortable with it, just because he was uncomfortable with the spotlight being, uh, being shined on him in, in that sort of a way. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's nice that we have a, a chance to appreciate what he has done for, for all of us here. So, uh, Yeah, that's, I, that's one thing that I want, you know, Emory draws people, draws students, staff, and faculty members from all over the world now, and I really wanted to let them know who Mr. Woodruff was and um, how he continues to influence us today. A lot of people think, oh, well, you know, he died in 1985, that was a long time ago, but... 
Mr. Woodruff really still has an impact on us, especially here at Emory, but in Atlanta. And I just kind of wanted to let people know about that, that, that he's still, that his legacy is still with us today. Well, they will uh, still be able to come up and see the, uh, the collection here in Marvel, but yep. the exhibit itself is running through June. Through the end of June, yes. The end of June. So um, uh, it's free and open to the public. And it is. Anyone can come on in and, and take a look. And it's on the third floor in the Shatton Gallery. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Randy, for your time. I do yeah. appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.